Next up, we have a talk from Bob and Joshi at John Hopkins University. They will be speaking about photometric redshifts from the Roman High Latitude Time Domain Survey, implications for supernova cosmology and galaxy evolution science. So you can share your slide now. Um, can you see my screen? I guess it's not. Uh... Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so I'm Bhavan Joshi. I'm a, a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and I work with the sup uh, Roman supernova pit. So I wanted to talk today about a, some preliminary results from an ongoing study we're conducting on the quality of photometric redshifts that we can expect for the Roman High Latitude Time Domain Survey. And what that means specifically for the HLTDS design considerations like depth and the number of filters and where to point Roman. So, this is work I've been doing with Rus Russell Ryan, Lou Stroger, and Rick Kessler, and several others in the Supernova Pit team. So, of course, redshifts are really foundational for pretty much everything in observational cosmology and uh, galaxy evolution. So, there is already a rich legacy, um, <clears throat> and there exist many mature ideas and techniques and software packages to, to estimate protoceans already. Um, so for example, SDSS, PANSTARS, DES, just to name a, a few, have these are ground-based surveys with photometry in five bands, typically UGRI, CY, and not much beyond one micron. Um, the conventional methods to estimate photoseas typically need um, a training set of spectroscopic redshifts. Um, and the photoseas are calibrated by algorithms that attempt to learn what the color redshift space looks like. And this training set of spectroscopic redshifts requires really accurate redshifts to the 0.1% level or so. And it, it is also a requirement that these spexes that are used for training also span the entire color redshift space and hopefully with dense coverage. Um, this may or may not be available for Roman. Um, it depends on where Roman is pointed to in the sky. So for this, so one important, really important caveat for our analysis, we, we wanted to understand what the limiting case is. Say, for example, you didn't have a set of spectroscopic training redshifts and you had to rely only on the broadband data to get your photoses. Um, we wanted to understand how that affects the quality of the photoses. So <clears throat> a couple notes about this assumption that we make. Um, that no spexy training sample will be available is that the Roman grism and prism data might not be um, as as high res spectral resolution as as is required for a training set, or it might not have the required depth. The other point is that we know that Subaru has committed um, 100 nights of PFS, um, but that. Um, getting a spectroscopic training sample from that might depend on the depth that is achievable and also given that it might only target host galaxies of type 1As or other transients that that might not be a representative training set. So for all these reasons, we assume that the li limiting case is that you're reliant only on the broadband data and therefore see what the photoses then look like. <clears throat> so. We relied on EASY, which is like one of the most widely used software packages to estimate photometric redshifts, um, to estimate redshifts for many different filter configurations uh, for the HLTDS. <clears throat> so we started with the, the reference survey configurations from Ben Rose's work from 2021. Um, RZYJ and YJHF, these are the wide and deep tier filter configurations for the design reference mission. Um, and we tested a total of 10 different configurations from four bands to seven bands. Um, and we used a catalog level simulation of galaxy photometry to do this. So in each one of our test cases of filter configurations, we tested 100,000 galaxies with two redshifts between zero to three, and we fit them with a redshift grid from zero to six. Um, <clears throat> 
a couple of points about Easy. It, it, it is a template-based fitting method. In particular, it is optimized to work when there isn't a set of spectroscopic training redshifts available. Um, <clears throat> and we also did not, haven't yet simulated a zero-point systematic offset. But if you're considering combining Roman beta with Rubin and other ground or space-based data, a zero-point systematic can become a concern. So this is something we're looking to do in the future. So I'll start. So these are the results from our four filter um, combinations of the design reference mission. So these two panels show on the left the RZYJ the, um, estimated redshifts and the YJHS estimated redshifts. Um, the top panels are basically Z versus Z, so Z inferred versus Z true. And then the bottom panels are the residuals. And obviously, these plots are really messy because you try to estimate redshifts from just four broad band, four bands. Um, <clears throat> and there are a significant number of outliers here as well, um, which is the most concerning bit right now. So if you look at, for example, the YJHS, I hope, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but on the right-hand panel, if you look at YJHF, the, the outlier fractions go from 63% for the full sample. And in this case, what I called high Z was wretches between one to three. And that also has an outlier fraction of roughly 48%. And the scatter is tens of percent. Um, the RZYJ fares a little better. Um, the outlier fractions are less than they're, they're roughly a quarter, like 25% quarter of the sample um, for the high Z sample and 30, 29% for the full sample. Um, as we go to um, five band, six band and seven band configurations, um, the, the performance of the photo disease gets much better. Um, the bias, which is the offset of the mean redshifts also gets improves a lot. Um, as, as you can see from these plots, so left to right, you're going from five bands to six to seven. Um, in particular, if you know that big blob of outliers at the top, um, that's a mismatch between the Obama break and the, and the Lyman break. And that goes away when we include seven bands. Um, <clears throat> so these are some common modes of failure. When you have fewer bands, um, there is a high likelihood of mismatch between, say, the 4,000 angstrom break and bomber break. And as you go to higher redshifts, um, even with fewer bands at higher redshifts, um, the results are still pretty good. <clears throat> so here, this, this is a messy table, but I'll, I'll go through it slowly. Um, here's the full suite of results for all of our test cases. Um, in each one of these columns here is showing a, uh, a configuration of filters that we considered um, from left to right. And the so the, the survey depth that we assumed in this case, in, in, in all cases, in our analysis was 28th magnitude. And we assumed that we get a signal to noise of 10 at 28th magnitude. And in our flow to Z analysis, we considered a slightly brighter cutoff, which is 27th magnitude here. Um, the the rows here are showing you the the scatter, which is defined by the NMAT and the outlier fraction for the full sample and for the high ratio sample. And the key takeaway here is that the bluer bands, in particular the R, R and Z bands here for Roman WFI, are crucial reducing the scatter and outlier fractions. You can see even with just four bands, RZYJ performs way better than any of the other configurations. Um, and if you want to reduce outliers, you, the, the long wavelength baseline is really important. All right, so I would like to um, consider a couple other comparisons with other deep field data. So just to make almost an apples to apples comparison with because HST and Roman have the same um, um, mirror size. The HUDF initially started its life as a as a 
a four band deep field with AC with a single ACS pointing. And it's been shown that if you add near UV data and near IR data, you can reduce the scatter and outlier fractions in your flow disease by a factor of two and three respectively. Um, if you consider another deep field, Cosmos, um, although they have greater than 30, maybe 40 bands at this point, um, many of which are narrow bands, but the photometric redshift performance is, is exceptional there with scattered and outlier fractions less than a percent. So pretty much on par with spexies or almost on par with spexies. The other thing I would like to point out with everything that we've seen so far, there are a couple of relevant requirements on the Roman from the Roman science requirements um, that pertain to photoses. One of them is the Roman must observe more than 100 type 1a supernovae per delta c equal to 0.1 bin. And Roman must enable a supernova survey with a systematic bias less than the values given there, which are on the order, order of 10 to the negative 3. So these these requirements might be at risk if if the the performance is is really close to the limiting cases that we've considered here um, so, so we need to mitigate this by maybe by considering a spectroscopic survey um, that overlaps the roman um, hltds area um, or by also and or by having other ground based observatories like rubin um, provide complementary data. So speaking of complementary data, we considered one other test case, which is I added Ruben UGRXZY data and Roman JHFK. So this is, these are now 10 band for disease. Um, and you can see the improvement is quite obvious and drastic, especially at lower redshifts with the Ruben data um, giving you the optical band passes. Um, the outliers now are less than a percent, as you can see for the full sample, 0.93%, and for the high Z sample, 0.99%. And the scatter is on the order of 2%, which is, which is very good. Um, one caveat is that I assumed for this simulation the same depth, which is a signal to noise of 10 at 28 AB mag, which is unlikely to be true for Rubin. But I think the broader implications for the, for the photo Z performance still holds. Um, if you if you are able to add complementary Rubin data for, or from the optical bands, um, the photosy performance can be improved a lot. Um, finally, given given that all that we've considered so far, um, our assessments, um, the blue S bands, particularly the R and Z bands, if you only have Roman WFI data, are critical to reducing the outlier fraction and the bias of the photosies. And you can improve the, the photo Z performance a lot if, if you are, have access to uh, optical band, bands from Rubin. A consideration for Ruben, uh, Roman HLTDS, wh where to point Roman uh, for the high latitude time domain survey. Um, it would be very helpful if we could point to get to get the spectroscopic training sample. If it, it would be very helpful if we could point Roman to uh, a field that already has pre-existing uh, species, um, for example, goods or cosmos or the nor north ecliptic pole field, and this can be these data can be taken before or after, but preferably prior to HLTDS execution, so that we can have time to calibrate the color redshift relation, um, and this can potentially also serve as a stepping stone for a future Roman deep field, which, as we've already heard many times. Um, over the last couple of days is, is going to be really important for galaxy evolution studies. Um, one other consideration for our future work, we're, we're, um, we're thinking of adding Roman prism and prism data within the fitting procedure to estimate spectrophotometric redshift, so photometry plus the low resolution prism or prism data. And we, we think this will help a lot for galaxies that for, do not have strong emission features in particular. Um, this has previously been done, been done for HST Grism data by Russell Ryan and myself, but I think, um, we're, so we're planning to do this for Roman as well. Um, 
think that's the end of my slides. I'll I'll take questions now. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Bhavan. Do we have any questions in the audience? Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, this is Yi Chen from uh, University of Missouri. So you mentioned that the bluish bands R and Z are important for photo Z. I'm wondering if this is uh, true for all redshifts or only for some um, range of redshift. Because uh, when you are talking about uh, your statistics, um, delta Z over one plus Z and outlier fraction, so it looks like you combine all redshift range. So um, yeah. that's why I'm wondering. Yeah, so once the 4,000 angstrom bridge shifts into the R band or, or rather than R band, you, you can do much better. But below those red shifts, you, you'll, have, you'll struggle with that. So I, I did combine everything when I, when I coded the outlier fractions. But you're right that within certain red shift ranges, for example, red shifts two to three or one to two in some cases, um, the performance is much better. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.